And we're here with John Feidelberg. Feidelberg, what is up? How are we doing, man? Thank you for having me. Of course. I, I see, you, you know, your Bruins rants on Twitter. And I said, you know, we need a new guest. We need someone new on this, on, on Bruins Beat. And I said, who better to have than Feidelberg, right? I mean, it, it's, it, it's been disappointing this offseason. It's, it's, there, first of all, there are a lot of better people to have than me. But it no, is nobody. Bad. You're the best. It's, <laughs> it's been actually real quick. Can we swear on this? Yes, of course. Yes. Okay. It's been a disaster. It's been wow. Some swear there saying disaster. I, I well, you, you, dude, it's so lame to ask if you can swear and then swear right away. This is that was true, just true. just to figure out, just to feel out later on. I, the I mean, it's 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 been worst case scenario. I feel like yes, it has been. And I so I will say this. We record this on Monday mornings. We're recording this on Monday morning right now. Um, no worse news, and this isn't even Bruins related, Doc Emmerich retiring. I woke up to that news. I woke up around like 9 o'clock, look at my phone, Doc Emmerich retiring. I'm like, what? Excuse me? That came out of nowhere. Doc Emmerich like. has been like a stalwart in my life. There's a question. We have a game here called Answer the Internet where they're all just like weird yes. kind of crazy questions. There is a question on that, on, in that game. If you could have one commentator commentate your sex life, who would it be? And my answer forever has been Doc Emmerich. There actually might have been a time when it was Jack Edwards, but it, oh, was, God. it was before. It was the original answer and the current answer were Doc Emmerich because he could somehow even make that exciting. The only thing the website Deadspin Good ever did, did ever, ever did good, was that clip where they just have him. It's like... 20 minutes of him saying different words to describe a pass. And it's yes. unbelievable. It's beautiful. It's artwork. It's poetry listening to Doc Emmerich talk. Yes, that is, that is the only good thing Deadspin's done. So I'm yeah. glad you pressed <laughs> it as the only good thing they've done. But um, yes, I was thinking Vince Scully for the sex game question, maybe. But I feel like that's a little too old timey. It's a I'm, little, I'm you an know. I'm anti Vince Scully guy. Are you really? Why? Because <laughs> everyone loved him too much. I yes, had to balance out the universe. Know. Everything he did was the most interesting thing in the world. I remember there was a viral clip of him. It was like three minutes or something like that in the seventh inning talking about, I forget if it was dirt or butterflies or something weird. I'm like, I don't want this in the commentator. I want, yeah. to, to my uh, experience, my, the greatest baseball is Doc and uh, Doc, Don and Jerry. Yes. Yes. That's, that's what I want. They laugh too much at my sex game. They'd, yeah, they'd they would. Giggle, they would there. laugh. They'd have like the pizza throwing laugh and that whole thing. <laughs> but Jack Edwards would be a great one. Jack Edwards would actually be pretty good. Uh, he's so intense. You know, he's he's you know he's cheering for you. He's going crazy. But Don almost be a little too intense. Like Jack and Gus would be like, "Come on, man! I'm like, I you're you're over the top. I know it's not like that. Like this is <laughs> this is a Pac-12 game at midnight on a Tuesday. Like I know you're not that into this." But yes, the Doc Emmerich news stinks. It sucks that he's going to be gone. I mean, incredible career. It's so funny that when, when, when legends like this retire, people kind of eulogize them as if they died. Yeah, so like do, the, all the thank you, Doc, you know, the videos. And it's all great. Like I, I am so for it. But it's, it's almost like if you didn't know he retired, you'd think, oh, he, he must have died. But uh, did, he just retired. Because of that. That's why I still, every single day I wake up and have to Google his Vin Scully alive because I forget every time because <laughs> he was eulogized so so strongly when he retired. I'm like, wait, did he die or did he just, just quit? Well, it was kind of the same thing when he was so old. And the other thing is, like, you almost – you have to save it, right? Like, you have, to, you have to have some stuff for when the guy dies. You have to have some <laughs> content built up. You can't just say everything when he retires. You know, like when Chara retires, for instance, whenever that is, all us Bruins people, our writers, everything, we're going to put out columns about him, all that stuff. And it's like, granted, you know, God willing, he dies, you know, way later. But it's like you're not saving anything for any of that, especially for these older commentators. But, yes, Doc retiring, tough news, tough Doc, news. I think, in particular, that's a good one to bring up with the Chara. Doc already gave Chara his eulogy. Right? I, that, that was the thing. Like, we all kind of at the time were, like, sitting there. Because it was like a 50-50 chance Chara probably wasn't coming back. And then hmm. Doc basically stops everything and goes, wait, we need to talk about Zdeno Chara as the line's <laughs> going along. And you think, wait a second, this guy must know something we don't. And then, of course, the questions after the game were all about Chara retiring. And then um, we asked him later that week, and he's like, no, I want to keep playing. And we're like, Doc, where are you getting that from? Maybe Doc's loser. I, remember Maybe I, was watching, I was watching at a bar, and it was like, you know, it was outdoors, COVID. So, like, there wasn't volume on the TV. So I was watching the game without volume and then just kind of following along on Twitter. 
and judging from Twitter, I was like, oh, shit, Chara must have told Doc that he's done and he's out. And then it wasn't until much later when I got home and watched the post-game press conference and stuff like that that I realized that he had said nothing of the sort. Yeah, and the funny thing with, with the Chara Emmerich thing was, like, Doc well, – I don't think Doc was in the bubble. Doc was home. Doc was calling yeah. those games from, like, his office, which was really weird. Right. Because uh, he was like – he was like a – he was great, and I loved Doc, but he was like a tiny millisecond late on every call, and I was like, oh, oh it's, sure. like the, I'd say it's like when the audio doesn't really match up to the screen. I couldn't take it, but you, you think about it, and it's like, when would Char have said anything to Doc? Like, would he have got on a Zoom call with him? Would he have texted yeah. him? Like, I feel like that's not a relationship that I could see occurring. Um, so I was, I, I kind of thought about that after when Char was saying his piece about he wants to keep playing. And I was like, oh, yeah, that actually really probably wouldn't have happened. Like, no, I, I don't I mean, know how they would have been insane if he just called Doc Emmerich. I mean, that would have been so anti Chara. Yes. It would have been insane. Yes, it would have been. It would have been very insane. But so let's get into the offseason. Let's get into this stuff. Um, so they signed Matt Grizzlick. They re signed Matt Grizzlick. Very palatable deal. Four years, $3.69 million a year, I think. Um, what do you think? Originally reported by NHL.com as what was it, 14.75 per year? Uh, did they say that? Yeah, there was a typo. I think they, they said it per season for what the, the total of the deal was. They also and- said Tory Krug was re signing with the Bruins, which was, I think it was, I think it was NHL the Twitter account, like NHL was like, welcome Tory Crew back to Boston. Really? Oh, like, what? <laughs> yes. Yes, they did. They, they, they muffed that, but yes, they typically have a habit of uh, messing up their tweets, but what do you think of Grizzly? Cause everyone has a little bit of a different opinion on him. I'm going to be dead honest with you right here. I do not know how to evaluate defensemen. When I played hockey growing up, I intentionally didn't learn anything about defense. So you could never put me oh, back. On. You suck. I was a defenseman. <laughs> I could only play four. I was like, I was like, dude, I don't pay attention to practice. I don't even know what, what, where their 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 requirements are. I don't know where their places are. I'm I know nothing about defense. And obviously, I know more than that. But that's what I would tell coaches. I I would tell like the Pavel Bure quote, where yeah, I'd play defense if I wasn't so good at scoring. Um, the uh, but Grizzly, I like. There's I, I I know the advanced stats show him and McAvoy are like the best defensive duo in the world. I don't know. I mean, I'm. I, I don't know the analytics that well, but I'm willing to give that a shot if that's what they say. Um, but I, I like Grizzly. I, he's a local hometown boy. Obviously, his dad worked at the arena. I think he's one of the better skaters you'll see uh, back on the blue line. And I think, as the dream has been for I don't know what's it two three years now whatever, he's kind of been the like the the power play quarterback in waiting so to speak. So I I, I have confidence that he can get that done. I, I, I think that. Of, of the moves this offseason, I don't think that's a bad one. No, it's probably the best one. I don't think – like, I, there hasn't been many good ones. I mean, no, Craig been, Smith. It's, it's there's been two. Yeah, it's Craig Smith and Matt Grizzly. That is it. Um, and you mentioned power play quarterback and waiting. Now Tory Krug is gone, posting cryptic messages on his Instagram story. Posts, you know, the, the, the shot of his St. Louis Blues practice jersey with the eyeball emojis and, and, and all that stuff. And it's it, there's definitely some – some uh, some animosity towards uh, Bruins' uh, upper management, it feels like, uh, especially. I think there definitely is, and I think it's warranted. I think that the way yes, it, the, the the way they treated Krug is not the way you treat a beloved athlete, not in the locker room and in the city. From everything I've heard about the locker room, that like Krug's the guy. You know, Char is the silent leader. Bergeron's the one who's going to speak up when you need to hear it. But the guy who kind of instills the camaraderie and, like, you know, the, the, the rather famous Bruins camaraderie that, like, everyone's like, I'll die for this team. I mean, you saw it with the, the press conference after they got eliminated. Everyone was downright distraught, as you – as all most teams are. But yeah. they it seemed to hit them particularly harder. And uh, I think that was, from my understanding, very Krug-driven, that everyone loved Krug. Krug was the guy who always got the boys together. And I think just not even giving him an offer, a real offer, is – is not the way you want to handle a, a superstar. I think the guys in the locker room are going to go, well, what the fuck's happening upstairs? And then I think other free agents are going to look at that and say, I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. Money always trumps all. But if you're between a few teams and you're like, well, fucking, I mean, they threw Krug out on his ass and he was a hometown boy, like homegrown, not hometown boy, but homegrown. And, and they, they didn't even care about him. So why would they care about me in the future? Yeah, I mean, I look at that, and I remember 
when it happened, I mean, we knew Krug was probably gone just the way that the talks had been and, you know, what Krug was saying. I mean, he was clearly pissed and what Sweeney was saying, which was a lot of nothing and a lot of like, we're just trying to move on with this. Um, but St. Louis seemed so off the board. I remember in his press conference the night he signed, uh, they were like, you know, was St. Louis ever in cars? He's like, no, no, not until today when they call with an offer. And I was just thinking like, that's a pretty big move to be like, oh, I'm just going to go from Boston to St. Louis, you know, today. I'm, you know, I'm just going to do it. Not and it was so big. odd to me. No, like, no. I, I, I'm sure they did it. I'm sure they covered their bases. Yeah. But like if, if the Bruins offer was, what was it six, six and a half? And, and they pulled it. And they pulled it. <laughs> but then like if St. Louis comes in with seven, six and a half, right? Something like that. Like, yeah. I, I guess Boston had no intentions of matching it or giving that offer, but I feel like it's like, look, I'm going to take basically the deal you offered. Offer yeah. it again and I'll fucking stay here. Yes, and I think he wanted to stay uh, in Boston. And he said that a million times. I mean, he wanted to be here. The other funny thing is you mentioned him being the guy in the locker room. It's kind of like he's that middle guy where, like, you know, you have the Charas and the Bird. Like, if you're a young player, let's say you're like mm-hmm. a Connor Clifton and you're a young guy, you know, you're, you're, you don't really know what's going on in the locker room. You're, you know, you're kind of a fish out of water in some sort you go in and you have a question to ask someone but you want to ask a veteran are you gonna to go to chara who's like up here or bergeron right. who's like jesus christ himself <laughs> no you're gonna to go to the middle guy i feel like you're gonna to go to tory Krug, who's like sort of in the middle of everyone and sort of like the the messenger between each side because you're sort of that middle group charlie yeah, coyle tory you know he's it's exactly not- He's like an Edelman type. We're like, you're like, oh, you're like, you've been here through thick and thin. You're, you're a warrior. We can tell that. But you're also not unapproachable because of your greatness. Yes, you're not going to go to, like, you know, Patriots. You're not going to go to Tom Brady. I mean, that'd be kind of – you'd feel weird doing it. He'd be very open to it. He probably would be very nice. But I feel like it would be very, you know, if you had a question about something small, not football-related, you know, I don't know what it could be, but something – it would be kind of weird to go right to Brady. If like you'd, you'd yeah, want you to go to Edelman, you'd want Brady to Krug. Like local Foxborough spots. Like, hey, where should I go get a beer? Yes. You don't ask Tom Brady yes. that. You don't ask Edelman. Yes, exactly. I, I don't think Brady would be caught dead in Foxborough. Uh, but, <laughs> yes, uh, I do think that Krug was that guy. I think losing him obviously sucks. Should they have re-signed him? Take the money. Take the – Take the, you know, should they have re-signed him? Was it smart to sort of move on? I don't fuck – I think – I think his game will age. I do too. Because you know, it, it, he's, he's not a bruiser, which is why people in Boston hate him because he doesn't fucking fight every three seconds. But the – not, not hate everyone. Hate, obviously love. But what, why the, that was the knock on him. Like, oh, he doesn't fucking lay the body. Well, he's 5'9". So what do you expect? But the – I don't know. Like, you think, look at guys like Niedermeyer. Like, they played – they were puck-moving defensemen who played – I mean, how old was Niedermeyer when he tired? 40s? I think he was uh, early 40s. Yeah. So, like, a 31-year-old with a six-year deal or a seven-year deal, he'll probably have some wasted money on the end where he can't really move anymore. But I think barring, like, a significant injury, I don't see why Tory Krug's, Tory Krug's game can't age. Yeah. I mean, I, I – it's just – it's funny because I look at this Bruins team and my opinion during the season was you have to resign Krug. Why? Like, the obvious. Duh. But that was also when there wasn't going to be a flat cap and the cap was just going to probably go up to like 85 or 84 or whatever it was. But of course, then a pandemic hits, screws all these free agents over. And now the Bruins are caught with a little bit of cap space, but you don't know what it's going to come in future years. You got to pay McAvoy. You got to pay Pasternak down the line. You you got to do all these things. (laughs) I don't know if you have to pay Pasternak. I don't, I don't think, I think he'll play for free. Okay. All right. That's fair. He'll he'll play for like clam chowder down at legal seafood. You give it, well, it would give him a blank check. But I think if you ask him nicely, David Pasternak will play hockey for free. So you just say, David, we'd really appreciate it if you played hockey for free this year. And he's going to be like, oh, of course. Yes. Well, well, Obviously. Yes, I love games. I love games. Uh, hockey, I love it. It's, it's the best. You're right, though. That is something he would do. He would definitely be like, I mean, if, as long as you give me a gift card to, you know, <laughs> the, well, not the forest isn't there anymore, but, uh, you know, Tavern in the Square, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> do it for Duncan gift cards from the commercials but yeah, yeah. you you do have to pay these guys it sucks i wish you didn't have to you could go them into playing for free you could give them you know supermarket gift cards but i do think that someone like krug the money in the end is going to be tough down the line you don't know what that's going to be like and you also don't know and this might be unpopular you don't know how long this bruins team is going to be contending for like contending contending like 
the, the cup, everyone says cup window's closing. You look ahead. You know, what's the future after Krejci and Bergeron down the middle? What's the future, you know, especially now on defense? Chara might be gone. Krug is gone. Your left side is Grizzlick, Lazan, John Moore. I mean, you don't have, like, a solid left side. Grizzlick's great, but other than that, it's kind of an o- open season. So you don't know um, what this is going to entail. Also, you needed to get a little bit bigger on the left side. Like, not to sound like one of those, you know, old Bruins fans who, you know, love Milan Lusik. You, you, you do have to have a little bit of size on the back end, and I feel like they were definitely missing that uh, with Krug. So, uh, Krug gone, Grizzlick in. I want to hear your thoughts on this. Last week, Marshawn and Pasternak out for the start of the season. What do you think? I thought it's about time they announce it. Because that, that, Pasternak in particular was the worst kept secret in the history of the world. I mean, yes. he was, like, hanging around Boston on crutches. And it's like, hey, guys, why don't we make a statement about what's wrong with the guys? Um, but I, I don't know. That's, that's one I can't get too worked up about or concerned about yet because we don't even know a start date. Like, they both might be ready to go by the start of the season. You know, if, if you're not going to tell me – I know they're aiming for – was it mid-January? January 1st is supposed to start. January 1st is supposed to start? Okay. So, I know they're aiming for early January, but with Gary Bettman, I don't have to think anything's set in stone. That's so, true. like, I wouldn't be shocked to see it be February 1st. I wouldn't be shocked to see mid-February – I think they have to, they're still evaluating like how worn down guys are after the bubble. You know, everything's so fluid and unexpected, and there's really no plan for anything. That if it started January first, I'd be very surprised. So I'm not overly concerned about injuries preventing the start of the season. The Bruins usually are a little, a little bit of a slow start anyway. They kind of find their stride after. But also with Park, Mar- 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 and Marchand, there is there's no real reason for concern. Because it's not like they're going to training camp together and like they got to find chemistry and shit like that. That that they're fucking plug and play. It doesn't. Yes. They can start whenever they want. The Pasternak and and Marchand, well, well, not more Pasternak because he does get injured a little more than than often uh, than regular. But he's like yeah, a, he a slips and falls and breaks his thumb. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he's like a Gronkowski where it was like when when the Pats were good, it was like just keep Gronk in a vault until January. And then yes. we'll unload him. It's like, just, just keep Pasta healthy for a playoff run, and I'm fine. If he misses the start of the season, I'm not going to freak out about that. That's a good point. I didn't think of that. You're right. I mean, I, you, we always kind of think, oh, my God, what's the first line going to be? And then you realize, well, it's going to be, like, what? A, not even more than a month. And if it starts on time. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see who they plug up on the first line. You know, Stanika, Craig Smith, um, hopefully and not Nick Richie. The great thing is it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You can put in anyone as long as it's, as long as it's Bergeron and Marchand that you can put in absolutely anybody. And it'll that's be- and that's and that's important because you they suck at secondary scoring. They have not been a good secondary scoring team the past few years. If you find that Andres Bjork works with, well with Marchand and Bergeron or Craig Smith or someone, you can move Pasternak down with Krejci, and boom, you and have a much because because the perfection line. First of all, is bullshit. No one calls it that. NBC does to man <laughs> trying to force it down our throats. No one calls them the perfection line. But the what was it? It was be- the right before the playoff run that ended with the cup loss uh, when Pasta was hurt, and they they had just Heinen up with the first line, and they barely <laughs> missed a step. It was you can put in anybody, so might as well put Pasternak down on the second line. I think he should play with Krejci. I've always thought that. Yes. No. I, I I've always thought you know. If you can't get production from the Krejci line, just put Pashnok down. Like, okay, yeah, they, you know, the first line won't score four points a game. But so what? You'll have more spread out scoring. It's the most obvious thing. You know, it's like when we were playing youth hockey, you know, the, you don't put the three best kids in the same line unless it's the last minute right. of the game. You, you spread them out. You spread out the talent. Uh, so I've, I've said you, – you mentioned the core earlier. And I think that if this core – which unfortunately all signs point to this happening. If they only win one, I think it'll be having done no research, the most disappointing core in hockey history, because yeah. that team, and, and it will be through no fault of the players. It'll be through no fault of the players because they've, if, if you look back like the 2011 team, that team was primed for a Blackhawks S front, like just dominance there year in year out, fucking three cups, four cups, whatever Chicago ended up with. And they, they were ready for that. And through absolute just piss poor management from the front office, 
they've done they've, – they've been there, don't get me wrong. They're, they're a talented team who's always kind of a threat, but they've done nothing since then. They've been, they've so been in the Cup twice. Obviously. I love this conversation because I do think that it is time we evaluate their legacies because it is getting to the end. And you do look at it and go – you, you know, credit to them for being consistent winners, contenders. I mean, the only they were only missed the playoffs two out of the past what thirteen years or something. I mean, it's ridiculous when you when you look at the face of it. And the two years that they missed the playoffs, they were still ninety point teams. It was it came down to the wire, and them missing the playoffs it was the the brutal fourteen, fifteen, and fifteen, sixteen years closed last two full seasons. But you're right. I mean, they haven't. You know, they've had they have the cup but they're one for three. Like that's right. a, and, and in other cities, I think you get away with it. You you know, like if you're in Detroit or you're in Arizona or you're in New York, I mean, you go one, you go, you go to three championships at all. Like people are, you know, getting TPs in their pants over it, but <laughs> you just here, you know, you have Brady and, and, and the Patriots who won six you have Ortiz and the Red Sox, who he won three. The team's won four. They're four for four. The Celtics have been disappointing. That's a whole other story. But the Bruins won for three. That's not too great. But And, again, I, I want to stress, I do not think the players have done everything you can ask for in players. They've been perennial all-stars or top-of-the-league players, always uh, Selkie, Norris Trophy winners with, with Chara and Bergeron. They've taken less money. They haven't, like, sat out. They haven't demanded the bank, which then – then handcuff the team in, in, in giving deals. They've taken less money. They've played their fucking hearts out. They've been perfect players and citizens in Boston. And front office has let them down completely by not being able to find secondary storm. Like anybody can just give David uh, Patrice Bergeron a contract. Anybody can just fucking give Brad Marchand a contract. But you have to find the fucking diamonds in the rough. You have to find the gems. And they have been incompetent at that. They've been yes. – the only time they found a top six winger for Krejci, they won the Stanley Cup. The formula is very simple. You, you <laughs> have – dude, every, think about being the front office of the Boston Bruins for the last decade. You never had to thought about your, think about your best center. You never had to think about your stalwart defenseman. You never had to think about your goalie. Uh, the last five years or however long it's been with Pasta, you, you never had to think about your top scorer. You were – everything was set. Everything that, that keeps GMs up at night was there. You went from Zeno Char and Dennis Seidenberg to Zeno Char and Charlie McAvoy. You're back to defensive. Wait, don't get me wrong, Seidenberg couldn't even fucking open his hips the last year or two. But still, there was – you went from just having the greatest blue line, a great blue line, a great first line, and, and one of the best goalies in the league, be it Thomas or Ta- uh, Tuca. That's, you don't have to even think about the things that are the hardest thing to think about. You don't even have to consider it. All you have to do is find secondary scoring, and they have been inept at it. Yes. Yes. I mean, I'll give them Pasternak because that's a, that's a thing. I mean, you, you got him, which was – you drafted him. You developed him. more. Was than that, that Shirelli or was that Sweeney? That was Shirelli. That was Shirelli. That was Shirelli, which is yeah. really odd to think yeah. Shirelli did anything good. But Because uh, Shirelli, I mean – great at negotiating contracts. I don't know what he has on everybody, but – Marchan and Poster are insanely underpaid already. Yes. Oh. And it, it's, it makes no sense. They both have like, what, four, five, six years left on their deals, and they're they already off. very underpaid. But yes. the aside from that, I mean, I don't know what you – again, those are, those are Shirelli's guys that you're just like, well, you're a great player. Here's money. That's not fucking hard to do. I could do that. Well, also, people kind of forget with Shirelli um, – Jeff Gorton was GM for like three months in 2006, and he had that 2006 draft where they drafted Lucic, Marshawn. Um, they went on. I think he laid the groundwork for signing Chara and, si- and Savard. So, like, Shirelli, like, a lot of people kind of give cre- credit to Shirelli for that. That's really not even Shirelli. Yeah. So, you look at the GMs. I mean, Sweeney, again, like, the, the one good thing he has been good at is re-signing his own guys. You know, you can go through the whole list. Halak, Marshawn, Pasternak, uh, Grizzlick now. Great at re-signing his own guys. But you're right. I mean, the secondary scoring, it's like you have the framework. Like, I always say this. The team, the, 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 as you say, the core you have now, that doesn't just come around every, like, couple of years. That, GM the, murder for that. that. Is, All I have to do is find third-line guys, second-line guys, done. Because I have Hall of Famers. I have a bunch of Hall of Famers and superstars on this team already. I can handle the other shit. What do you think about Game 7 against the Blues, though? That's kind of on the players. That one's on the players. 
I mean, the players. they just didn't, they just didn't show up. So yeah, you have to put that on the players. The, I mean, that, that one was done as soon as that, the Marchand play. That was like, that, yes. I was like, this is over. It's just how disappointing was that? You were there. You were, I was there up in the uh, Big J journalist booth, but you, you were there. Like, you were there, right? I think you were at the game. Yeah, I was at the game. And it was, I immediately just like started sulking. And that, I, I knew right then and there that, that it was just like, all right, these guys just don't have it tonight. They don't want it, whatever you want to say. But that was a defining play for this Bruins core. Again, despite the fact that I think. Most of the blame goes on the front office for failing. And what's funny is, uh, I remember sh- right after it happened, Shaughnessy pointed it out. Um, and when every everything started, you know, the last year for Boston sports have been kind of not amazing. I mean, you have the Bruins, you have the cup loss, Marshawn gets off the ice. Um, the Red Sox trade Mookie Betts. They've been putrid this year. Patriots lose Brady. So it's funny. And, and I remember Shaughnessy pointing out when Marshawn went off the ice, Ever since then, everything has gone wrong for Boston sports. And it's like, shit. (laughs) That was a bad play, but I actually did a little research this morning, and I discovered that it's really – it's through no fault of anyone's that the the sports vacuum that has hit Boston since COVID, really, because it's all Tom Brady's fault. Tom Brady is a supernatural hero who drags greatness with him wherever he goes. And when he leaves, he leaves just a pile of rubble in his wake. He did it in San Francisco when he was born. He brought the 49 The 49ers were dominant from 19. Tom Brady was born in 77. From 80 to 95, the 49ers were – they won it in 81, 84, 87, 88, 94, I think, mm-hmm. something along those lines. 95, Tom Brady moved to Michigan. Michigan, Detroit Red Wings win two Stanley Cups, 96, 97, 97, 98. And also the greatest story in sports in that era is Blackhawks, oh, not Blackhawks, Avalanche Red Wings. That was just, that rivalry was insane those four years. 2000, Tom Brady moves to Boston. Obviously, we know what happened here from 2000 to 2000. Yes. 2020, Tom Brady moves to Tampa Bay. Lightning immediately win the cup. Tampa Bay Rays in the World Series. The Bucks are on primetime every night. It's just, it's just we, had, we had the magic here. We did. I mean, I guess he's sort of, and I saw you tweet that this morning. That is kind of like the the good luck charm. You get that, and boom, you're good. I mean, he go to Arizona, and they would have just ample success. The Cardinals would be, uh, or not the Cardinals, the the Diamondbacks would be in the World Series, and the, 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 the Cardinals Coyotes would be in the would Super be something Bowl. People have heard of. Yes, the Coyotes would be in the Stanley Cup. It would be just amazing for the NHL. I, I'd actually know if I wanted OEL or not because I'd have fucking watched a single game he ever played in his life. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest. The OEL stuff, uh, I, you just look at the stats, look at the advanced analytics, and it's like, oh, that's a player who declined at age like 25. <laughs> I don't think that is someone I'd want on the Bruins. But that, that scoop on Brady you have there, that is a all-time, like, <sighs> moment. It doesn't make sense. It's crazy. It's, it's like I, I was half joking about it on Twitter last night, and then I kind of yeah. dove a little deeper, and I realized, like, it's, it isn't just – that he brings championships and greatness. The game itself changed. Like Bill Walsh brought in the West Coast offense. Fucking the the Avalanche Red Wings rivalry was just a brand new thing introducing the Avalanche. Kevin to Boston, Celtics invent, invent super teams. Uh, Bruins bring, bring the first cups in the 70s. Red Sox break the curse. Like it's, it's not just like, oh, they win a championship. It's they changed the game. That is that is true. I mean, they, they the Rays. I mean, the Rays have been doing this for a few years, but the Rays down there, you know, pay, you know, on a on a salary of like twenty dollars total, yep. go to the World <laughs> Series. Like that, it is. I mean, it's like he's reinventing the wheel everywhere he goes. He just inspires so much in, in, in ingenuity and intelligence. Um, that is incredible. That is a hell of a scoop. And like, so that's such a viral tweet. Like when you think of when you think of viral tweets, that is a perfect like. If you could get that in, a, in 240 characters or less, that is such a viral tweet. When it's ins- it. it doesn't make any sense, Evan. It doesn't make any sense at all, all, like, all of the greatest people. And you know what? If we want to really get down to brass tacks, when he was born in San Mateo, Silicon Valley was just getting started. That's where, like, app, like he changed the world over there, too. Fuck. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, mean, I didn't even think of that. And, and, and I guess you're right about that. I mean, it's Silicon Valley – I don't know what he did in Detroit. Maybe the, a couple of car manufacturers came back to Detroit <laughs> yeah, in his that. time. <laughs> Maybe then, but 
Jesus Christ. Jeez, the intelligence you bring to the, the, the so, – So, like, the thing is, like, as disappointing as this offseason has been, it might be out of our hands. It might just be the plan of the world. It's, it, right? it is. Because we have to suck now. Now, that's why I think we should be, like, preparing an Olympic-style bid for Brady when he decides to finally retire. Like, we'll build you arenas. We'll build you monuments. We'll, we'll restructure our entire city planning for Tom Brady as long as you come live here because you bring what we need. So as long as he lives here, he doesn't have to play here or, like, be a GM yeah, here. As long as he he just wasn't lives. playing when he was a kid, right? He was just, didn't, just living in San Francisco. That's true. So he just has to live here. All right. I don't know if that's going to happen because of Giselle, but um, I think if we organize a mass, like, you know, pitch, uh, a huge, uh, uh, the greatest PowerPoint you've ever seen in your life, and you just say, Tom, please come back. Yeah, Massachusetts. No taxes, needs no tax break yeah. out the wazoo. We'll pay your taxes. You won't be taxed. You, you know, I know you're wealthy, but we're not going to tax you. You can have all, all every dollar you've ever earned. We'll give you money. We'll, we'll do anything. Um, but that is a, and maybe the Bruins would have got Taylor Hall had, um, what did you think of Taylor Hall going to Buffalo? That was nuts. What the hell's wrong with him? I can't figure Taylor Hall out. I, he's seems like a good guy, but everything he does just perplexes me. Is that like, it just, there's gotta be some story that's with him. That's following him. That explains all of these moves. Every, every everything, just like why Ed, why Edmonton doesn't want him, why uh, New Jersey doesn't want him, why Arizona feels like he probably didn't want Arizona. But just a, a player that good, a player who won an MVP what four years ago? Hart Trophy. Uh, uh, oh my God, that I think it's three now, but that's wild. That feels like yeah. yesterday. Yeah, I know it's great. I, I it was two thousand. I think it was sixteen seventeen with the Devils. But like you shouldn't be bouncing around that much, even the one year deal. I, I I think I read that the Bruins were close on that, which sure. to me, then like, why do you fucking not choose Boston? Why do I, you choose- I don't understand. I guess the only reason would be to put up your point totals with Jack Eichel because you know you're going to be like the guy for Jack Eichel. The other thing is, has a human ever lived in Edmonton, New Jersey, Arizona, and Buffalo willingly all in their life? I don't think so. No, I can definitively say no on that. I don't know. I don't think up. I just. Back. No, yeah. there's no reason to look it up. There's no – who would ever do that? I mean, maybe Arizona because, like, that's nice weather, but it's also, like, 135 degrees in the summer. But It's not nice weather. I, I've never even been to Arizona, but I just know it's not nice weather. That weather would suck. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe during the winter it's okay. I'll give them that. But in the summer, that sucks. That that sucks. But New Jersey, Edmonton, Buffalo, I mean, good God. Like, that is trash. <laughs> that is trash. But at any rate – Feidelberg, thank you for joining. Is there anything you'd like to plug before you or before I let you go? I know you plugged the Brady piece, but is there anything else? Um, nah, listen to KFC Radio if you want. If not, that's okay too. We understand. Okay, well, listen to Bruce Beat and KFC Radio. I'll, I'll say, listen to both. Feidelberg, thank you for joining. Uh, and for CLNS Media, I'm Evan Marinovsky. You Bruins Beat listeners, have a great rest of your week.